So you're in Texas? I am in Texas. I'm in your uh, Houston, Texas is, is where I'm at. Houston just got a nice story somewhere I just read. I can't remember. Some really <laughs> good press from Houston, though. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, t- uh, yeah, Texas is rounding. There's a lot of headlines right now about like starting a business in Texas, and it's the right time to do it. So it's an interesting time. It, Texas is growing tremendously right now, especially around the Houston and, and Austin area. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Dr. Swan, I greatly appreciate you uh, you joining today. I've been following your work um, for, I guess, for about three years now. And I think you are solely responsible for me getting rid of all plastic and all the uh, bad cookware from my kitchen um, oh, and, and, pr- and probably making me sound like a crazy person when I'm around family. You know, following your work and listening to your podcasts and interviews. I probably sound like a crazy person at the at the dinner table because I don't want to eat off plastic cookware or heat my food in plastic cookware. So I was curious what your family and friends think when you know if you try to steer clear of all that stuff. Like, what? How do you approach those situations? Um, I don't offer advice. Well, that's actually not true. I do offer advice, but <clears throat> try to not to be judgmental and try not to, you know, be heavy handed. Mm. But I do, you know, even in a restaurant or, you know, when eating out somewhere and I see that they're using uh, plastic, like a plastic straw or plastic silverware or, you know, um, I try to suggest, you know, alternatives in in a nice way without being heavy handed, you know, but just, you know, trying to. And people are pretty receptive because this is, you know, not rocket science at this point you know it's just a yeah and i think it is getting it's getting more accepted that we should be getting rid of single-use plastic especially yeah what about like things like air fresheners in your car or the plug-in air fresheners no 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 i know yeah so i'm i'm on board i i don't use that stuff but yeah you know from my family that is not you know, doesn't follow, you know, the, the work that you and other people do, I probably sound like a, like a crazy person. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to use yeah. air freshener. I'd rather just open the windows or burn right. essential oils or burn some sage, something like that. But it makes right. me sound right. like kind of woo woo. So what about stuff like that? Um, well, I try to avoid scent. And when I'm around people who are using a lot of scent, you know, whether it's, um, a woman, you know, sitting next to me on the airplane with a lot of that's, that's a little difficult for me. Cause what do you do? You're sitting on the airplane. Somebody sits down next to you. They're reeking, you know, <laughs> and it, actually not a lot you can do is except maybe change your seat. But um, when I can, I just say, um, I fib a little bit and I say, well, you know, I'm allergic to these because uh, some people are right. Yeah. I'll say, well, I'm al- well, I am kind of allergic, mentally allergic, you know, but not, <laughs> maybe not physically allergic to, to these smells. But, and you know, it's also um, like laundry detergent. You can make choices in the store so you can buy something fragrance free and you're not losing quality. You're probably gaining quality because people, companies that make the effort to, you know, produce, their products fragrance free are probably aware that this is a, you know, something that's better for the yeah. public. So I just say, I would say to people when you can, without being offensive and without being <laughs> a, you know, a real <laughs> drag, you know, try to um, avoid fragrance and maybe point it out when it's not necessary. Um, is it ever necessary? I'm not sure, but um uh, there certainly when we measured um, the phthalates in our population and we asked women about whether they chose fragrance free or whether they use fragrance, it, their levels were lower, definitely significantly lower if they avoided fragrance. Mm-hmm. So if that's something that you care about, and I think you should care about this, especially if you're thinking about getting pregnant or maybe are pregnant or if you're a man same thing goes for men by the way (laughs) as you know um you know if you're thinking of conceiving a pregnancy then you might want to um 
make a special effort to avoid these things. Yeah, definitely. You know, since you've been on all these these podcasts and I've seen you on numerous YouTube videos, has your work become? Has there been more interest in your line of study? Has have more people become on board? Not necessarily in the scientific community, but just in the general population. Are people starting to wake up a little bit? I think so. I mean, it's hard for me to judge. I don't do surveys of population opinion, but I am actually amazed that um, two years after, so our book came out in February, 2021, and that got a lot of attention. And I was told, well, you'll get attention for about three months. Um, Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I can edit all Um, this out. You'll get attention for about three months. And here it is two years later. And my schedule isn't really much lighter. It's just like I continue to get people who are interested, um, ranging from podcasts like yours to um, people who advise companies on how they might, you know, make safer products and um, filmmakers. And there's just a lot of interest in a lot and regulators. Actually, I've talked to congressional committees. Um, So, that's encouraging. Of course, I'm just one person and we really need to grow this to a much, much bigger, actually international level. But there has been, in the EU, there's been actually more action than in the United States. And that's pretty encouraging. Not There's a whole army of people, you know, who are aware of this and working on getting better regulations and um, getting out safer products. So I think we're going in the right direction, but Oh, probably not fast enough. Of course, that's also true of climate change and, you know, which is related to this. So we are all concerned about a lot of things. I recognize that, you know, COVID, and climate change, and this is one other thing to put on people's plates. And sometimes that gets to be almost too much for some people. So I understand that. I was wondering why, you you know, the the UK or the, you know, the EU is so far ahead of the United States. When it comes to government regulations and blocking chemicals from being used in, you know, skincare products, why are they so far ahead of us? Wow, that's a big question, John. I mean, I think it has to do with a whole history of regulation, not just these chemicals and the machinery. I think the fact that they're this is being handled at the higher level, at the EU level, not at the country level so much. Well, both, but the EU has taken a stand on this, that um, it's more, uh, well, it's hard to ignore a statement coming out of the EU. You know, it represents a lot of people. And so I think industry has been somewhat more responsive in, in the EU. But there's large parts of the world that are completely unregulated, you know, continents, whole continents mm. <laughs> that we we have no regulation at all. So, um, yeah, there is it's a it's a big job and a different kind of job in different countries. I'm talking to somebody tomorrow um, in Spain. I've talked about people in Brazil. I've talked to people in South Africa, you know, all over the world, um, there are more people getting interested in this question or these questions, I should say. Um, and that's, that's really encouraging. And, um, yeah, so it's, uh, but why the EU is better regulated than the U S I think, you know, we had, um, uh, we had, a kind of a revolution 1987 i think with tosca but the chemicals that were um in use at the time and there were many many thousands of them and they were just grandfathered in they would say okay this has been on the market for a long time we're not going to deal with those okay 17,000 chemicals so okay maybe they've been on the market but people have paid attention and now we should not pay attention. So that's kind of one of the bad things that happened and that didn't happen in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, There's like some crazy statistic that I'm, that I keep hearing that America has, has only like 11 chemicals that are banned from cosmetics. Whereas the EU has like in the thousands, which is pretty amazing. Yeah. I've actually heard 11,000. I, that you and I could be hearing the same thing, or maybe even 
encouraged for me. I don't know, but um, th- whatever the numbers are, there's you know several orders of magnitude better regulation in the EU than in the U.S. That's for sure. Yeah, mm. that's intense. So I was curious, you know, your book and and in a lot of your interviews, you, you talk about the impacts that endocrine disrupting chemicals can have on boys in the womb. Uh, why are boys more susceptible to these impacts and, and how come women aren't? Um, that's such a great question. And I, I just want to mention that males are more fragile. It's, it's not what people think, you know, but if you look at the, um, the rate of stillbirth, you know, fetuses that die in the womb, it's higher for men, males. So, so males die at a faster rate from the moment of conception on probably. And if you look, of course, that the population over 80 or over 90, or, you know, there's a huge sex difference, you know, many, many more females. So um, some people have conjectured, and I think this, there is definitely something here, that the fact that females have two chromosomes, XX, and males have XY, means that there's the possibility of repair mm. for females that, that is not there for males. So, um, but I'm not a geneticist, and we you should get a geneticist on to talk about this. I think this is a fascinating, fascinating question. But we see in so many ways that males are more sensitive, not just to EDCs. I mean, after a, a serious um, disaster, natural or man-made, whether it's 9-11 or whether it's the Kobe earthquake or whether it's something else, you look at the sex ratio and fewer males are born. Mm. It's like nature is saying not right now let's let's back off for a while and stop producing so many you know because this is a dangerous time um it's it's a phenomenon that's well known in my field most people are not aware of it but um and we see with covid that males are more sensitive you know um and so it's true for endocrine disruptors as well um it's, it's almost as if males have a strike against them from the moment of conception on. It's really hard to understand, but um, who knows why that is? <laughs> you know, that's a sort of a teleological question, but but it is true often, not always, but often that the effect of chemicals that can alter the body's hormones impacts males more. Now, as far as the chemicals I studied the most, which is the chemicals in soft plastic, and like phthalates, they um, have the ability to lower testosterone. So, so both males and females need testosterone, but for males, it's particularly important, mm. right? And it and it governs the development of the male reproductive system, and also sex differences in the brain. So, if you're lowering this critical chemical at a critical time which is depending on the system for the reproductive that's early in pregnancy, first trimester. If you're messing with that signal, then the male doesn't kind of get what he needs to fully masculinize. And that, that's, that's one of the reasons why, you know, I talk about this a lot because I study it. Um, and, um, you know, it influences actually the size of the genitals, which a lot of men care about. It influences testosterone in a way that continues. And we see, you know, problems with test- falling testosterone worldwide, just as falling sperm counts worldwide, which is pretty scary. You have more and more young men coming in for testosterone replacement and being seen for ED. So this is, um, it's all, you know, that's all testosterone related. And so when you have deal with chemicals like phthalates that lower testosterone, you're messing with a pretty important system. So that's a long answer to that. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Does, uh, does testosterone, does do male testosterone levels dictate how much sperm a male produces or is it the, or is it the other way? 
So the development of the male reproductive system, you know, is multifaceted and part of it is testosterone and part of it is development of the Sertoli cells, which will later, later become sperm cells. All of that is, um, we would say, correlated. They're, they're all related. Okay. So if you lower, um, yeah, so, so things that lower testosterone, ultimately, when the fetus grows up, will result in lower sperm count mm. on average and and that's that link the link to that early exposure and the later sperm count seems to be this distance which i think you've heard about and read about which is the distance which is called the taint <laughs> or the gooch on the street you know the <laughs> grundle yeah. all kinds of names but but this distance is simply the distance how much space the generals take up Right? How much is how much real estate? Right, and um, so in a in a typical male, that's going to be more than in a female, right? Because the for the female, everything is offside, if you will. You don't see the ovaries, you don't see the eggs, you don't see where they were in a male. They're out there, they're hanging there, and 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 so they're taking up room. So that distance, if that's shortened, that means that everything there is smaller. Right, mm -hmm. and that is controlled by testosterone in early pregnancy. It's really weird, isn't it? But but that's that's so critical. It's to give the guy a good start <laughs> in those first weeks of pregnancy is it's really important. You don't want to mess with that. Yeah, what's you know scary when I you know I read in your book is that the is that the anogenital distance is that the right I yes. guess the scientific yeah. term? That's good. Yeah, um, great, perfect. <laughs> awesome. I don't sound like an idiot. Uh, uh, yeah. That that distance is shrinking, like compared, to, you know, to today compared to the I guess nineteen fifties. That distance has shrunk actually, by actually, John. I wish I knew that. Oh, okay. I think it is, but there's no data oh. on AGD anogenital distance in the nineteen fifties, and here. Not in humans. So, so here's the story about this little measure. For a long time, all the way back to the 1912, I think, scientists knew that in rodents, males and females, they knew about it. They knew it was important, and they knew that for females, it was smaller than in males, and it makes sense. And it's actually true for most mammals, but. It wasn't used for human studies. It wasn't used for epidemiology. It wasn't used for the kind of thing I do until, you know, in the late, like around 2000, um, I started to hear about this distance as something that had been looked at in animal studies and one human study, but had never related it to these exposures. So I thought, okay, what's going on here and then i heard about phthalates right so a, a colleague of mine john brock from cdc we were sitting on an airplane we had a lot of time and he goes shauna you should look at phthalates and i said well, i never heard of them nobody heard of them this was 2000 and um why and he said well everybody's exposed to them they're you know everyday products they're very common and in animals they cause this disturbance of general development, which is called the phthalate syndrome. Okay. So I was like, whoa, that's kind of big because there aren't any other syndromes. There's not a dioxin syndrome or a PCB syndrome or a, you know, whatever. This is singled out as an important enough to give it a name like this. So I thought, okay, what, what is that? And, and so I looked at that and I studied that <clears throat> and um, people at, um, EPA had been publishing on this and um, also the National Toxicology Program. And, and they were showing that specific, you know, if you fed the mother certain phthalates in her water <laughs> or in her food when she's pregnant, early in pregnancy, this is a rat. Can't feed this to humans, by the way. <laughs> Not ethical. But if you do this in a rat or a mouse, you see that this distance is actually shortened measurably shortened, significantly shortened, right? And then you can see other problems, um, problems with whether the testicles descend properly, not so much if the mother is exposed, and whether the scrotum is 
smaller and so on. And yes, this is all smaller and less developed, mm. less moving in the masculine direction. So let's back up for a minute and, and, and let me just point out, you know this from reading this. I know you know this, but maybe your listeners don't know this, that originally starting out, the <clears throat> genital tract is very simple. It's just one ridge. It's the same in males and females. You couldn't tell a male from a female if you didn't do a genetic test, right? And um, and then in rats around day 18, in humans, we don't know exactly, but somewhere in the early first trimester, they, there's a genetic signal to start pro- testes to start developing, the testicles to develop, and they produce testosterone. And that starts setting things in motion. And what it does is it makes the males and female genital tracts diverge, become different. And then what will be the ovary in the female becomes the testicle in the male and so on. Right. So if, if you interfere with that, um, you're going to um, end up with a, a boy who is not completely masculinized. And the result of that is that when he grows up and starts to produce sperm, he will have fewer sperm. And when he goes to try to have a child, he will be less fertile. So how do we know that? We know that by looking at this distance in adult men and seeing that men, and we did this and other colleagues did this in, in men. It's easy to measure, by the way. You just need the little calipers, and probably a lot of people listening to this are out measuring right now. But <laughs> <laughs> you can, oh, if it's shorter, then the man, on average, will have a lower sperm count, and infertile men will tend to have a shorter distance. So it's all kind of one package. Um, and it's all tied to testosterone, which in turn can be influenced by these chemicals. And that's why I'm so hot on these chemicals. So what is the the distance, I guess the normal distance of this AGD? Like what is considered, you know, demasculine, a demasculine men? Yeah, I don't want to say that, John, because I don't want to um, make people, you know, it's, it's tough, right? Yeah, it's a tough topic. Right, I don't want to say. <laughs> but I will say that um, it's about 50% bigger to 100% bigger in males than females. But the other thing is that it depends on your size. If you're a big guy, uh, you're going to have big everything. You're going to have big hands. You're going to have big ears. You're going to have, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a, so we always talk about AGD for your body size. Right. And in children, it's also related to how mature you are. So maybe were you a preemie? And because we measure babies. And and so if the baby is a preemie, didn't have as much time to develop, it's going to influence that. So how old is the is the baby and how big is the baby? So a big baby, like an eleven pound ba- male, is gonna have a much bigger AGD than a than a small. Okay. You know, so it's and then there's other things that, that matter, but those are the primary things, the age and the size. And But for an adult male, it's going to be related to, to body size. It may also be related to other things like race, ethnicity. We haven't really studied that very well. It may be related to other things like diet and obesity and so on. One thing we know it isn't related to, which is interesting, is that we we took... Um, you know, because it's a measure in women too, by the way, mm. and maybe I should say a little bit about that too. But if you you wonder, well, maybe different parts of the menstrual cycle will be different, right? Because lots lots of things are going on there, and maybe and it turned out it wasn't. It was the same throughout the menstrual cycle. So it's not something that's easily alterable. And scientists believe that the relative AGD you're born with, your AGD for your size and age is going to stay with you for life. Just like if you're born with short hands or small feet or, you know, small ears, they're going to stay with you relative to your body size for your whole life. And that's, that's the way it is with AGD as far as we can tell. Okay. Now that said, we don't have, because we started measuring this in 2000, we don't have any, Grown adults 
to remeasure. Mm. And you asked whether AGD has gone down over time, probably because sperm count has and testosterone has, but we have no historic records of AGD in, in 1950. Okay. The only way we could get this would be, I mean, you don't even know how we could get it. I, I guess I was thinking you could like, and I, and this is, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a scientist at all, but I would think in like, you could measure men that are in their, you know, eighties or, or seventies and then compare that to every generation after and see, you know, if there's a trend, but I don't know how many, I don't know how many men in their eighties would want you to go measure their, their gooch. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Uh, it's a good idea. And they've done, they've done that with testosterone, but nobody's gonna, done it with AGD, but it's a great idea. Um, whether we also, like I say, it doesn't change over your lifespan, but we're, we don't know that because we've never measured it. So that's something we really, really need to do. And our, we're hoping to remeasure our boys that we measured when they were born and see what their HED looks like. But it's hard to get, find them. Right. And it's hard to get them to agree to come in and be measured because it's, not, the, <laughs> it's <laughs> not something you love to do, right? Probably. Right. Um, but um, it's, it's a really important question. And um, all we can do is say, well, look at the correlates. Testosterone has gone down. Sperm count has gone down. Fertility rates have gone down. Probably AGD has gone down. That's really all we can say. These things are correlate, but, you know, it's not the same as actually demonstrating it. And I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. A sperm Another thing to ask is just let me say, there are sometimes men get testosterone replacement. I'm sure you know that. And does that change things once they're adult? That's Ooh. an interesting question. Or maybe they get testosterone for, um, you know, they want to change their gender identity, right? Mm. You know, and uh, they get, that would be a female, but they uh, they want to have hormones that will change. Their, so, so hormonal, can hormonal treatments in adolescence or adulthood change AGD? Unanswered question. Mm. Unanswered question. Okay. And I hope to be able to to do that, but that takes a grant and you study it. Yeah. You know. That'd be fascinating yeah. to, to yeah, see. Yeah, right? I just so we're clear, testosterone and, and sperm counts in men, Does do those levels affect men's overall vitality, mental health. Yes, absolutely. Everything. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what lots I mean, of things. Yeah. In mm -hmm. what way can you briefly explain? Muscle mass. Um libido. There's two really important things. Yeah. To guys, right? <laughs> yeah. But what and to women too, by the way, let me just let me just say um two things about that. One is that there was um a study in China which looked at workers who were manufacturing another chemical called BPA. You know about BPA. It makes plastic water bottles hard. Okay. <clears throat> and they found that men who were working with this in the production process actually um, had lower libido, had more erectile dysfunction. Okay. Yeah. And in our study uh, of women, Pregnant, we got pregnant women and we asked them about their sexual satisfaction, their sexual frequency. And when they had higher levels of phthalates, they had lower sexual frequency and lower satisfaction. So it's libido. It's all, it's all tied to testosterone, right? So if testosterone goes down and you have all these problems and including, you know, I mean, this is, you probably read about, you know, people, fewer couples getting married. Yeah. Fewer couples, of course, having children. Part of that is a choice. Of course, you choose not to. But why you choose not to is complicated. And how much of that choice is tied to your chemical makeup is un is not clear, but it's probably related to it. Uh, um, so it's, it's a huge social phenomenon. Um, and then you have, along with that, the, you know, fewer children being born. 
and and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's it's really big story. Yeah, I just read an article yesterday. I think it was from the LA Times saying that most couples these days are opting out or waiting to have children because um, of the unknown of the future. And mm -hmm. I, I think that's a piece of it too. But I think as a society, especially here in America, we place a lot of emphasis on women going to get you know going to school, you know, getting educated and climbing the corporate ladder. And being a mother is not on that priority list. So uh, the article was didn't mention anything about chemical exposure. There were it was kind of blaming, not really blaming, but highlighting what we as a society put emphasis on. But I was I was wondering and kind of curious why they didn't you know reference anything from a chemical perspective. You're really asking some great questions, John, and and whether a couple's or a woman's desire to op, you know, to not have ch children, desire less interest in having children, less interest in staying home, whether that's related to um, chemical exposure, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. And um, frankly, as an educated woman, I think it's a great thing that women are getting educated and, 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 um, or climbing the corporate ladder and so on. Um, so I wouldn't blame chemicals for this if they played a role. Um, but we really don't know. It's, it's never been looked at. But but we do know that in societies, that as societies become more educated, as they become more urban, as they be, as women you know enter the workforce, the fertility rate goes down. There's no question about that. Um, and many people think that's a good thing. And I, you know, I'm not going to put a value judgment on that at all. All I'm saying is that if a couple wants to have a child, they have, I think, a right. I think that's a basic right that if they want to, they should have the right. And that should be not taken away by early exposure to damaging chemicals. Hmm. You know, sp speaking of the couple topic, one thing I learned reading your book is that Mel uh, men are also, I guess, 50, it's 50 cent or 50 cent. We're 50% responsible for infertility rates or, or miscarriages. Um, and I didn't know that. I, I guess as a, maybe it's my toxic masculinity. <laughs> I thought that, you know, if a, if a man can, you know, make sperm, then we're good. It's, you know, we can right. have kids. I, I didn't know that, you know, we're responsible for infertility rates as well. That's a good thing to realize because women carry a lot of blame and, and guilt, you know. Um, if a woman can't, if a couple can't get pregnant, the woman, and they're having sex, and he's ejaculating. So what could go wrong? It has to be her. Right. That's, that's the assumption, right? And, and actually, that's not true. As you pointed out, um, it's about 50-50. So in infertility cases, if you actually go for a workup, you'll find that about one third of the responsibility is can be you know tied to the man, whether his problems in his delivery system or with the sperm themselves. But um, the female also about a third, and then then there's about a third which is unexplained. They just don't know what what's causing that. Um, so I think it's really important for Oh, I'm so sorry for this. Okay. I, I can. <laughs> I think I can edit some of this. I think I can edit most of it out, so it's not a big deal. Okay. Um, so it's important for the both the man and the woman to realize that it's a joint venture, and it's nobody's fault if it doesn't work. And together, maybe they can explore how to clean up their lives. By the way, cleaning up their lives to help their fertility, you know, it's not just chemicals. I, I should mention this. You know, there's a lot of things in lifestyle that affect fertility. And everything that your doctor tells you to do to improve your heart health will also improve your fertility on the average, right? So, you know, not stopping smoking, cutting down on alcohol, um, losing weight, getting exercise, not being a couch potato, <laughs> trying to reduce your stress, all of these things 
help your health. And part of your health is your reproductive health and your fertility. So, I mean, we've done studies where we asked, what do you eat? What is your diet? We've done a diet free, you know, dietary frequency. These are questionnaires, food frequency questionnaires, and looked at those food frequency questionnaires and, and couples that were using, well, this was men, men who were eating a Mediterranean diet, a more, you know, heart healthy diet had higher sperm count had higher sperm count, right? And we looked at stress. How many stressors do you have in your life? You know, whether it's a loss of a job or loss of, a, you know, your partner or serious illness or moving. These are all major stressors. And the number of those was related to sperm count, right? And on and on. All of these things are, are related to sperm count. So if you want to improve, if you're having trouble, or even if you think you might be having trouble <laughs> when you try, um, think about making a clean, safe environment for this conceptus that you're going to be creating ahead of time. Mm. Because it turns out that the sperm are produced all the time, and it takes about 70 days to produce a sperm. So in that wind-up period before the man actually produces the sperm that's going to conceive the pregnancy, that sperm can be damaged by lots of things, including these things I've mentioned, as well as chemicals. So um, if you know, if you want to make have the best chance of succeeding and having a healthy pregnancy, then try to clean up your act, you know, a couple months beforehand. Yeah. Um, and it will help you in other ways too. So it's a win-win situation, I think. Yeah, it's interesting too that men can can do that. We have the option of making choices to, to clean up our act and, you know, reduce stress, eat better exercise. But women are kind of screwed from the get-go, right? I mean, they're born with the amount of eggs and the type of eggs from, from birth, and they can't change anything. Is that correct? That's right. Uh, That's correct. And in if, so yeah, you're right. A woman is born with all the eggs she's going to have. She loses some rapidly before she's actually born. And, um, and then, she can, you know, be, those eggs can be damaged. Her fallopian tubes can be damaged. She can get infections, you know, and, and so on and so forth. But um, the new sperm that is, are being produced by men can be healthier. So that's right, that man can, in some sense, have more control over the success. So maybe the men are more responsible. <laughs> uh, so I was, yeah. I was curious, what were the the latest metrics on sperm count, infertility rates, miscarriages? Um, can you talk about like you know what what today's numbers are in in 2023 compared to uh, you know what yeah. it looked like 50 years ago? What do the numbers look like? Oh my gosh, 50 years ago. Okay, so there have been a lot of studies on how sperm count has changed over time, and they've all, as far as I know, or though there might be some small ones, but there's many of them and they show a decline. And the question of where the decline is and in who it is and how much it is varies with the study. So we put this all together doing what's called a meta-analysis, which is a study of studies, if you will. And um, we published the first meta-analysis in 2021, 2017, sorry, 2017. And that was actually the trigger for the book in 2021. And what we found was that sperm count had been reduced by 50%. So back when we started in 1973, the average was 99 million sperm per milliliter. That's the concentration, 99. Mm. And then at the end of our period, which was 1970, which was uh, 2011, I believe, um, it was 47. So there, it had dropped by slightly more than 50% over that time. Now, this we were not the first, first people to say this. Actually, a, a very important study came out of Denmark in 1992 that said pretty much the same thing. We just included a lot more studies and did it using methods that had not been available in 1992. So modern or more modern methods, right? But um, it was very solid. And most of the data in that paper was from Europe, 
North America, Australia, and New Zealand, because that's where the studies were done. So that left half the world not represented, really, with very few studies. So that paper was limited, in some sense, by the scope, the geographic scope. Um, But it was what was available. And so we did it again recently, and that just came out a few months ago. And what we found was that these other continents, which was Asia, Africa, and South America, had published more studies enough to be able to look at them and say, yes, there is a significant decline in those continents as well. So that was a big breakthrough everywhere. The other thing is that the rate seems to be increasing. So instead of dropping, you know, around a little over 1% per year, since 2000, the drop is over 2% per year. So it's accelerating, which is not a happy situation. Yeah. That's that's scary. That's an, yeah. I, you yeah. know, in, in your book, you mention that Homo sapiens meet their criteria for becoming or uh, for getting on the endangered species list. Can you talk about that? Is that still accurate? Yes, although nobody is putting them there. <laughs> right, <laughs> understood, <laughs> understood. Um, yeah, but, um, you know, their their habitat is being destroyed in a way, that which we know is very critical to non-human species. Um, fertility rates are going down and so on. I, I think it's not likely that we're going to get on an endangered list anytime soon, but I think we need to be aware that it is a threat. It is a threat. And um, other endangered species have gone extinct. That's not that I'm saying that humans are going to go extinct, but it's something we should worry about. And, um, you know, our signals for declining fertility have come always from the animals first. So Rachel, Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, you know, it was about the birds. It was about the Great Lakes, the animals there. And then we took it personally, if you will, and started looking at humans. So I think we have to take our signals from other creatures on the planet that we share the planet with. And there's no reason to think that they would respond differently than us. I mean, fertility rates are going down in lots and lots of species, including humans. So people say, oh, well, that's fine. We have too many humans or that's fine. People choose this. Yes, but you can't say that about the alligators and the frogs and the other animals, you know, that are having their numbers reduced. They're not choosing this. They're not choosing to delay childbearing. You know, they're not using contraception, (laughs) you know. And so I think the more we think of ourselves as fellow planet mates, if you will, with these animals and subject to the same risks, I think the more honest we're going to be with ourselves about what the risks are. Hmm. Yeah, there. Th- I guess there is some good news in in that you know humans are resilient, and if we put our minds together, um, you know, we can come up with workable solutions, which is good. And it, but it takes you know work from people like you to to make us aware. I, I've men- I've heard you mention a study that you're working on called Farm to Table, and can you explain what what that is, and you know where you're at with that one? Or farm to fork. So I guess that, it that was called. kind of a dream, actually, John. I'm oh. not actually doing that study. Oh, you're ma- <laughs> you you you're getting my hopes up. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, what I would love to see, and somebody listening to this wants to fund me to do this, I will definitely do it. But <laughs> what I'd love to see, because this all takes money, right? Right. What I'd love to see is if we take a few um Foods, simple foods on the farm, a tomato, an egg, a bottle of milk, you know, and so on. And actually measure what chemicals are in it then when we collect it. And if it's an organic farm, probably, hopefully there won't be many that are endocrine disrupting. Of course, they're always chemicals. They're made, everything is made of chemicals. But, and then see what happens as it goes to 
you know, it's being shipped. What's it being shipped in? Okay, what's the level of the chemicals during shipping? What's the level of the chemicals? If you're going to take that tomato and make it into tomato sauce, what happens when it enters the plant? When it leaves the plant, it's probably got more phthalates in it because it's gone through plastic tubing, right? Mm. It's going into a jar. If that it goes into a tin can, it's going to pick up BPA. And that's good. So what happens to this product as we take it from the farm to our table? And our table, of course, will pick up the the chemicals in the nonstick pans and in and, and, and storage containers and so on. So along that path, where do the chemicals come in? What they are, what are they, and how how can we avoid them? And one way we can avoid them, if you think about that whole process of that that tomato is going through or that milk is going through, that egg is going through, one way you can avoid it is to buy the product as close to the farm as possible. Hmm. So if you can buy from at a farmer's market where it hasn't been packaged, where it hasn't been processed, where it hasn't, nothing's been done to it. It's just put in a bag if you want a paper yeah. bag. <laughs> Go buy your tomatoes in a paper bag at the farmer's market. You're not going to be picking up any chemicals. So um, that's the study I would love to see done. But it's, you know, obviously you can't do it with everything. But for a few food items, it would be great to know where along the way specifically the chemicals come in and which chemicals and what can we do about it. That, so that's yeah, a study still to be done. That would be an amazing one. So I, I I assume you're a big fan of uh, regenerative agriculture then. Yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So am I. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, but I'm not a farmer and I can't talk about the details, but I, I know that, you know, we want to obviously keep re vitalizing our soil and revitalizing our water and our air. Absolutely. Um, and, and, um, planting in a way that's going to support um, chemical-free products. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, and uh, another topic in your book, and I, I don't know how to approach the topic without uh, without sounding homophobic or, or anything like that, but there's some correlation between endocrine-disrupting chemicals and the way uh, not just humans, but also animals identify as, right? Because you can, I think you talk about a study that took, that exposed a frog or something to uh, chemicals and, and that, and, and those frogs were attracted to the same sex and Correct. there's, and there's, and we're seeing something similar in humans. Um, we, and I, I know like talking about this is we have to tread lightly, right? But like, how do you feel about this and what is the public, what is their perception when you, when you do talk about this? So you're right. This is an extremely delicate, difficult, sensitive area. And I start by saying, first of all, you don't know that gender identity issues have increased. And some people may challenge me on that. But what we know is that there's more talk about it. There's more reporting of it. However, 50 years ago, nobody would have thought of saying they had issues with their gender identity. Mm. It was not on the radar. So there's there's really no way to know what, how those rates have changed. Um, and the other thing is that we need to sort of separate the issues here. So the frogs you talked about are frogs that were exposed to a pesticide, atrazine, and either in the wild or in the laboratory. And those frogs, first of all, did have what's called disorders of sexual development. They were born with testicles and ovary in the same individual. Mm. That's rare in humans, it's rare in animals, but it's it's unquestionably a disorder. Okay. <clears throat> but that can be caused by atrazine. If you go further, you can ask, aside from that, did the frogs exposed to atrazine change 
their sexual orientation? Did they change the genetic sex of the frog they wanted to mate with? Right? And um, yes, it is possible to produce in the laboratory frogs that are genetic males that prefer to mate with other males. Mm. That's homosexuality, right? Right. The third question is the most difficult, and that is, what is the gender identity of these frogs? <laughs> now, gender identity has to do with how you feel about your body and whether it's aligned <clears throat> with your, <laughs> whether your image of yourself is aligned with your genetic sex at birth, given at birth. And there was no way to know that about these frogs because we can't ask them. That's the only way you can really know someone's gender identity. They feel perhaps they're in the wrong body. They were misassigned, if you will, at birth. And in that case, you know, what would that be for a frog? Right. <laughs> you know, so 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 we don't we don't really know um whether chemicals play a role in this disorders of you know i shouldn't say disorders this issues with gender identity right there's there's no way to know um except it's possible that we could follow cohorts of pregnant women for whom we have samples for whom we know the chemical exposures and see over the course of you know the first 20 30 years of life whether the occurrence of these disorder you know these questions about gender identity came up more frequently for children or adolescents or young adults if their mother had been exposed so that's a study that could be done it has not been done no one has ever done that and um until we have that kind of long-term follow-up and can relate it to what was the prenatal development or possibly what was the father exposed to before he conceived the pregnancy or what was the newborn exposed to, you know, through food and so on. So those early exposures are important. They're more important. Why? Because that's where things are developing very quickly. Right. right? So if we had those measures, uh, from 50 years ago, or 30 years ago even, or even 25 years ago, we could maybe start to look at that. But no one is, to my knowledge, and and uh, and I think that would be a good thing to do. So short of that, I think we have to say a person's gender identity is a choice they can make, which is not necessarily, and maybe not at all, tied to their chemical exposure. Right. And I think we have to be careful about separating these different areas of concern, if you will. Is there another you doing this type of work in America? Are you like the only person uh, really talking about this, you know, these chemical exposures and phthalates and doing interviews? Oh, there's there's a huge number of people that work in this field. I think I just gained visibility because of the book, okay. I think, and because um, I'm comfortable talking about it, which not everyone is, and because I'm concerned. You know, I think that 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 um, we have to be really careful not to, um, you know, medicalize, if you will, people's sexuality. Not to, you know, I think it's important that if somebody goes into this field and talks about it, that they do it not with an eye to explaining a problem because that's not what it's about. It's, it's about choice and it's about identity. And this may or may not have anything to do with the chemicals. You know, we have to leave, be open to that possibility. Absolutely. Right? No, agreed. If someone is, wants to reduce their chemical exposure on a daily basis, what are kind of the top five or 10 things that you would recommend that they implement or avoid uh, in their lives? Okay. 
So food, I think, is a major source of exposure, right? We talked about that. And so to the extent that they can buy unprocessed food and eat it quickly and not store it in plastic or tin cans, the better off they are. That said, I want to add that not everyone has equal access or equal ability to do this because if you are lower income, you are more likely to live in what's called a food desert. You don't have processed foods nearby. You don't have farmer's markets nearby. You don't have availability of these lower, you know, exposed products. So um, ideally, eat organic, unprocessed food, eat it as close to the farm as possible, <laughs> and and um, don't store it or cook it in um, pans that are nonstick or in containers that are going to convey exposure, right? So foods. Um, water is another source. And by the way, now we know all these things break down into microplastics and those are in water and they're in our air. So foods, water, drink, don't put this in plastic bottles, don't drink out of plastic bottles. By the way, not all plastics are equally bad. So you know, we, that's another story we don't have time for now. But um, if you can, you know, go to glass, um, you know, or porcelain or some, you know, product like that, you'll be avoiding exposures. Um, and air. Um, so these we also get these chemicals through the air. And if we can use a HEPA filter, um, it'll help reduce our exposure. If you can lose you know, leave your shoes at the door <laughs> and and put on some clean shoes. You keep this stuff out of your house. Um, and avoid scent, things that smell, if possible, um, because they are going to contain these chemicals. And and then if you have the, the bandwidth to look it up, you can look up products, cosmetics, personal care products, laundry products, sunscreen that are safer that are, have fewer chemicals. And a good place to do that is Environmental Working Group's website. They have a lot of consumer you know, areas you can go to. You can go to cosmetics, you can, all of these things you can look up on Environmental Working Group and say, oh, I should buy this chemical instead of this, this product instead of this product and I'll reduce my exposure. So those are some easy, you know, relatively easy things to do if you have the time, the bandwidth and the money to do them. I appreciate it, Dr. Swan. Those are great. And uh, I think, I think, like I mentioned in the beginning, I think my wife was, was thinking I was cheating on somebody named Shauna because I was like, Dr. Swan, Dr. Swan said we got to do this. We got to <laughs> buy, we, we got to buy stainless steel. <laughs> you're well, you're well known in, in our household. So it was Good. a pleasure speaking with you, Dr. Swan. And uh, I know you're extremely busy, so I appreciate you making time. It was great talking to you, John, awesome. and I loved your questions. Thanks so much. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.